Good morning and welcome to The Football Show. Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher are here. And earlier in the week, Gary was talking about Carlos Tevez' time at Manchester United and suggested that in the latter stages of his career that he down tools at United. Well, we're joined now by Carlos Tevez' agent, Kia Jirabchin. Good morning, Kia. Um, just give Hi, me morning. your response to the comments. OK, first of all, can I just say, since we passed a, another momentous, uh, momentous Thursday, uh, can I just take this opportunity to thank all the frontliners and the NHS for the amazing job they've done over the last two and a half months? Um, I'm here because I feel that Gary said something a couple of days ago, and um, I fear that he, I think that he was absolutely wrong. And I often let things go, but I think that when you go after somebody and you know you've made um, a lot of wrong and, and incorrect statements then by letting it go will um, will not do the benefit uh, to the public uh, of listening to, to, to fake information. Um, Gary mentioned um, about Carlos down tooling and his professionalism. And he also mentioned that there were problems um, in his second year about talking about um, people talking in his ear, his people talking in his ear. So, Generally, I have three comments and three questions for Gary. Um, in terms of the people that he claims were talking into his ear, I'd like to know who he thinks were talking into his ear and what they think they were saying in his ear. Because unless he was hacking him, them or taping him, uh, he could have, he couldn't, he, he, impossible for him to know what they were apparently saying in his ear. And I'd like to know who those people are. Furthermore, I think, you know, um, I must apologize. I gave an incorrect stat uh, during my previous interview. I said Gary played four times mm, in that year. He actually played one time in Carlos's first year because, unfortunately, <laughs> Gary was injured. And he played 10 minutes against Rome. When Gary made a comparison between year one and year two, um, Gary could not have known too much about year one because he played 10 minutes that year, not four times, as I correctly said. And... He was mostly in the treatment table, and that's the actual year that he actually said good things about Gary, uh, about Carlos. And finally, you know, I think that Sir Alex Ferguson was one of the greatest managers of my time. And irrespective on what side of the hairdryer you were, um, you had nothing but respect for the, the man. The one thing that I think that I learned in my time about Sir Alex was that he had his finger to the pulse all the time. And um, he was a strong coach. He knew what his players were doing in the training ground, off the training ground, at home, uh, on, a, on a weekday. And by Gary making those comments of the second year, he's in somewhat questioning whether or not Sir Alex had his finger to the pulse. Because Sir Alex picked Carlos 51 times during that season of 208-209. 51 times. He picked Rooney 49 times. Berbatov 44 times and Gary himself only played 29 in that season in that in those moments Carlos played 51 games picked by Sir Alex 15 goals 7 assists Berbatov 14 goals 11 assists and Rooney 20 goals 13 assists Sir Alex would not have picked someone 51 times during that season as Gary well knows if they were down to link or being unprofessional unless Gary thinks that Sir Alex took his eye off the ball. You want me to answer? I'll answer the three questions one by one, Keir. I mean, in terms of the first one, um, the period in Christmas season when it was quite obvious that Manchester United uh, weren't going to exercise the option, there is no doubt that Carlos, in that last few months of the season, became disinterested, distracted. He wasn't the same around the training pitch. He's, he, he went into a more of a sulky mood because he was disappointed that the club weren't signing him. He definitely played he was in the first... Uh, <laughs> you're, you're a madman, you. He's, <laughs> this is serious stuff and you're messing around. No, he definitely... I mean, Keir, you'll know that Carlos was definitely not the same player in the last four months, five months of the season in the season I mean I don't know what stats you're referring to there but ultimately what I did yesterday I looked at the Premier League and the Champions League stats of Carlos over the 
the sort of the two seasons. <clears throat> Um, and I'll, it refers to the third question. I don't know if we've got them, but you can see that Carlos in the first season, I said on the uh, two days ago that Carlos was, Carlos was amongst the best uh, front three that I've ever seen in the Premier League. So these, these are the stats in the Premier League from 2007-8 and 2008-9. You can see in the first six months there, uh, Kia, that Carlos played 18 times for Manchester United starts and seven goals in the second six months. He had 13 and he had seven goals. But if you look at the last six months, Carlos, to be fair, at that point was only getting... In the last year, he only played 18 times, which is the same as the first six months in its entirety. And he only had five goals in his second season in the Premier League. So Carlos's performances in the second year dipped. And the same in the Champions League, he scored, he scored a lot less goals. So, look, my view is there were definitely other complications that Carlos had in terms of the club not triggering his option. You've admitted that. And I saw Carlos in the last five months at the club. I, didn't, I don't need to do my research on this. I was, I was watching the boy. And the thing about Carlos is, Carlos was a warrior on the football pitch. He was an amazing In the first 12 months at Manchester United, I've never seen anything more brilliant than him with, with Wayne Rooney and Cristiano Ronaldo. However, in the last four months, the drop in, the drop in his uh, manner and his performances, just because maybe because he was obviously not being taken on by the club, was alarming. When I refer to the people in his ear, I mean, it is true that Carlos was owned by third-party ownership. At that time, it was being... Uh, it, was, it was legal, obviously, and there's no problem with it. But I think Manchester City paid sort of £50 million for Carlos Tevez to his owners, whereas Manchester United were paying £25 million or were supposed to pay £25 million, I believe, for the option. And I just felt at that moment in time there was so much distraction around the third-party ownership. There was so much noise about how much the third-party owners were going to make. These were things that were in Carlos's ear all the time. The club weren't exercising his option. He wasn't being picked in the team as much because he was substitute. Those appearances that you name, a lot of them were substitute appearances. So he was definitely a different person in that last five months at the club. Now, what I would say is that down tools might be a little bit crass, but Carlos was distracted, he was different, and he certainly wasn't anywhere near the level in that last four months at the club. You must accept that. Well, I think... The one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer to that question is that Sir Alex himself said when he signed Carlos, he said, I'm going to sign this boy because he's going to give me 15 goals every season across um, the competitions. And of course, when he signed Berbatov, um, he, and the, the club decided to sign Berbatov instead of signing Carlos that year. Um, when he signed Berbatov, uh, Carlos was um, at the very beginning of the, the season put to the side. Although I have to say that as the season grew and things got deeper and deeper, Carlos was more and more involved. Being picked 51 times, he appeared 12 times in the Champions League that season. And the season um, before he had appeared 12 times in the Champions League, he had played probably, you know, his best football because at West Ham at the very, very beginning... Um, under Allen, I think, you know, he had played on the wings, etc. And Sir Alex knew exactly how to get the best out of most most and every one of his players. And he did manage to get the best out of Carlos. And I think saying that he was distracted, I don't think that Carlos was distracted. Carlos, in towards the end of the season, when he scored that goal, ran over to the touchline. You, you remember that famous moment when he put yeah, his hands yeah. to his ears? He, won he, he, he wasn't distracted. He was very focused. In fact, more than anything, I think he was trying harder and harder to prove to Sir Alex that he's going to make a mistake by not signing him. But when the deadline passed and Sir Alex didn't sign him and we arrived at Rome for the Champions League final, I think that was the moment that broke into Carlos. Um, when he was benched on the Champions League final and then he came on as a sub and, and you guys ultimately ended up losing that. That was what broke his back. But I don't think that it's fair to say that his entire second season, he was down tooling and not professional and on the treatment table. Carlos missed three games to injury. Carlos hated the treatment table. There are famous moments where Carlos had had massive fights with doctors because he refused. Jose Mourinho saw a game of Carlos in mm, Sao Paulo um, in 2000 and 2005 when Carlos had an ankle three times the size and the doctors wrote him a letter saying, 
if you go on this pitch, you could potentially end your entire career. Carlos is not a guy that sits on the treatment table. Carlos is not a guy that has never has been unprofessional or down tooling. I can understand what you're saying in terms of, you know, maybe Carlos was, you know, distracted in his mind because he wanted to stay and 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 he hadn't had his contract sorted out. But that would go for any player um, that is a, that, that is coming up to become a free. And if Man United had exercised the option at any point in time, there was nothing the third party owners could have done. In fact, the Premier League made very clear that situation that the third party ownership had no say whatsoever in Carlos's future whilst he was a Man United player. They had a fixed price. And Man United could have exercised that option right until the day when that option expired. And as, you know, unfortunately, I can't quote numbers, but it was considerably less than what was ultimately paid. But it was Man United's choice, not Carlos's choice. Kia, just on the point where you say around to Alex Ferguson was picking Carlos, and you know, you said that Carlos had 12 Champions League games. Carlos actually started four Champions League games that second season. So we, you know, we we do stats here at Sky Sports. Thankfully, we've got people who do them for us. You know, I would say that if Carlos Tevez, the quality of player that he is, and I'm saying in the first season at Manchester United and since at Manchester City, this was one of the best players that I ever played with. So I'm not questioning Carlos's talent. But for him only to, games, to only be starting four games in the Champions League in the second season out of 12, to only start, I think it was 18 games out of 38 in the league... That's 50%, less than 50% of the game. So Sir Alex wasn't picking him. He had him on the bench quite a lot, Kia. And I'm saying that, obviously, from a stats point of view, that is very different than starting games. There is no doubt in my mind, Carlos in the second season, through Berbatov, through the uh, distraction with the, um, the, the, the the option, there was so much pressure in terms of the fans singing and also the, the, the media that were obviously you know honing in on this situation every single day. In the last four, I think it became too much for Carlos and he was very different in his personality and character around the club. And there's no doubt about that. He just basically looked like he'd switched off. Like he, Maybe it's because he didn't feel loved and maybe down tools is the wrong expression. But the reality of it is in the last four months at the club, Carlos was nowhere near the same player. That's what I was trying to sort of say three days ago. I was never questioning well, his talent. Well, yeah, you but you compared his year one against his year two. And my... You know, my question for you was, you know, how could you have compared his year one to year two when you were not there in year one? You, you yeah, appeared yeah. 10 minutes <laughs> for Rome. So you can't be speaking from experience. And second of all, in year two, yeah. even when he was even when he was a um, substitute in in some of the games, he still scored 15 goals for the club. Um, and the year one, he scored 19 goals for the club. And the following... You know, and two years after he left the club, he went and won the cha- he went and won the Premier League again with Manchester City. So, the question I have, you know, you made you made a very strong remark about his professionalism. Um, you said what annoyed you because you were a Man United guy that in year two he just faded. People were talking in his ears, and you never really clarified who was talking in his ears and what what were they saying to him. Well, first thing here is to suggest that I'm not aware of what was happening in Manchester United's dressing room when I was in the in the dressing room every single day. And I used to go to every single game and I was in the dressing room before matches. I mean, I was actually witnessing it firsthand. In fact, probably more than I would do if I was actually playing, where I'd be more obviously looking at it from a point of view of my own performance. I was in the dressing room every single day with the players. The injured players still tr- go into the dressing room every day, watch training, see the players, sit with the players. So to suggest I couldn't comment on... You know, what Carlos was like in year one when I watched every single game and was in the dressing room with him is obviously I don't think correct. In terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, the people in his ear, I mean, it is, it is an assumption, Kia, that when someone is third-party owned, I mean, Carlos was owned by a company. He wasn't owned by a football club. In fact, I don't even know who owned Carlos uh, Tevez. However, those people in my ear, if you're owned by somebody else outside of your... They must be speaking to you about what's happening with your contract. And I basically knew that the speculation around Carlos in that second year, when the Manchester City rumours started, that they were going to pay double what Manchester United were going to pay. Those rumours were being fuelled all the time. And my assumption is that that distracts players. There is no doubt people... 
wouldn't have been speaking. I mean, for you to say that you wouldn't have been speaking to Carlos, you're so close to him, and you wouldn't have been speaking to him about Manchester City's interest. When did you first mention Manchester City's interest to Carlos Tevez? I mean, let's be honest here. You'll have mentioned Indeed. that whilst he was still playing for Manchester United. You must have done. We know what goes okay. on. So, so when I said when I said you know if you had bothered to call me, I would have filled you in, and you would have had more information. And when I mentioned that you know. You don't. You didn't do your research, and definitely in this case, was because the Premier League made it very, very clear after the West Ham incident that no ownership of Carlos whatsoever was allowed during the time that he was playing at Man United. So the company that had the rights to Carlos's um, playing contract had to give up all their rights in favor of an option, and Man United were the only people that owned that option. So during the two years, he had no third-party ownership whatsoever. Man United had him on a two-year contract with an option to pay a further fee to keep him for another four, five years. He actually had a five-year option with them. So if you had called me, I would have explained that to you, and you would have known that there was no third-party company owning him whilst he was at Man United. Yes, when the option expired, the rights would have gone to a third party. But until then, there was no third party. Second of all, Gary, if you're referring to me as the people that were talking in his ears, Manchester City's takeover didn't happen until the season when um, Berbatov signed for United and that famous uh, moment when City signed Robinho. Um, City had no interest in Carlos um, or had spoken about Carlos because nobody knew about Carlos's situation until almost May of the following year. Um, and Carlos was very determined at that point in time to stay at Man United. So when you say people had spoken into his ears, no one has spoken into his ears because we, didn't e we couldn't even influence the situation if we wanted to influence the situation because Man United okay, had okay, a permanent I, option on him. I, I, I'm aware of the option situation. However and economic rights of Carlos Tevez, the money was going to a third party. And when Carlos Tevez went to Manchester City... But the economic rights party... were given up. The yeah, economic rights that, were but, given but, up when he signed for Man United. The deal but, was finished. That, but, there was no yes, third was. party at that moment in time. But I'm talking about when Manchester were going to trigger that option... The third party then resumed a level of control over Carlos because they were receiving the money from Manchester City. Who owned Carlos Tevez? I mean, who owned Carlos? Correct. Let's 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 go let's go backwards onto Liverpool. Okay, Liverpool had the exact same contract based on Mascherano. There was a third party that was owned, and when Mascherano signed for Liverpool, the third party gave up its right, and Liverpool had a chance at any moment to exercise an option and. That was that, because they owned his rights and they could just extend that contract further for another four years. It's exactly the same as if you, when you were a player, had signed a, had signed a contract with you know, another club and said, as a, six months before your contract expired, you had signed a contract with another club and you were going to move. On that moment, you have no decision once you've signed a new contract of where you're going to go because you've signed a contract to go there. Carlos had signed a contract to go to Man United and stay there permanently for two plus four years, which adds to six. He had no decision-making in that. So where you are now trying to change the situation on third-party ownership and take it down a different line, I'm trying to bring it back into the question that you know you had raised, which was about down-tooling and professionalism. And no, it wasn't no, about okay, third-party. Okay, if you want to have I a understand. debate about third-party ownership, I'm more than happy to have a debate with you on third-party ownership. I know why you're taking it away from third-party ownership, because the minute that Manchester United didn't trigger that option, the third-party owners came back in play. You said Sir Alex Ferguson before took his eye off the ball. Uh, you said to me, would Sir Alex Ferguson have taken his eye off the ball? Why did Sir Alex Ferguson not trigger the option then if he thought that Carlos Tevez was the right player for Manchester United? Well, exactly. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, at the end of the season, David Gill called me and said that we want to, we want to exercise the option and Carlos will be in touch. When you guys were in South Africa that year for your pre-season pre, pre David Gill and both Solarics made, a, made an interview about it. After when the move of Berbatov came available, 
I think that they needed to use the money for that particular transaction. And they used that transaction instead of purchasing Carlos. In January, he had the option. The moment Sir Alex wanted to sign um, Carlos was in May of that year. And in May of that year, Sir Alex pulled Carlos and said, we want you to stay before the Champions League final. And after the Champions League final, um, he called Carlos and he said, you know, I don't know where you are. He, Carlos had already been back in Argentina. I don't know where you are, but, you know, I'd really like you to stay and I want you to come back to United. But it, the option had already expired at that moment in time. And Carlos was already looking at other options because he was quite disappointed that during the two seasons, Sir Alex hadn't signed him. So at some point in, my, in time, Sir Alex actually changed his mind in wanting to keep Carlos because he realized that Carlos, he was about to lose him. Maybe during the period of time, they felt that because they had the option and they had a chance to just sign a paper and send it to the Premier League and sign Carlos for four years, they didn't believe that they could, they had any urgency to do so. And maybe after the urgency had finished, they realized that they were about to lose him and that was too late. But I don't think, you know, Kia, just talking to, about so, professionalism and down tooling Kia, has anything Kia. to do with that. Okay, I'm trying to connect the dots here. Manchester United signed uh, Dimitar Berbatov on the two, start of the 2008-9 season. They beat Manchester City to the signature of Dimitar Berbatov. And Manchester City at that point, I think, were quite upset. They thought Dimitar Berbatov was going to go to them. During that next season, Dimitar played some games. Carl played a lot less, a lot less. And Manchester United at that point decided not to trigger his option, probably part way through that season, whether it be around Christmas or whenever it would be. Is it, am I right in saying that the owners of Carlos Tevez made double the money by going to Manchester City than staying and triggering the United? And it was actually in the interest economically of the owners of Carlos to actually him not sign that option and him not have a good second season at the club. Well... I think what would the, I think the point that you're you're transferring to is about what the financial economic rights of of, of the player occurred after Man United had not triggered the option, and I think the most the most thing that you have to realize is that a lot of players, when their contracts run down and go for free, they obviously demand more at that moment in time than they do when they when they have to when someone has to pay a hundred million for them or eighty million for them. The point was that, of course, Manchester City were going to pay more than Man United, and so was at that moment in time Real Madrid, and so was at that moment in time Barcelona, who had both made official offers for Carlos once his option had expired, and, and the word had got out that the, the option has expired. But Carlos's decision was that he was quite um, taken back by Manchester City's, at that moment, approach, because Manchester City had come in with a lot of love for him, and he had felt that maybe towards the end of the, the contract in May, he wanted to stay at United and, and United hadn't exercised that option. And so it was time for him to move on because maybe Berbatov was the new um, darling of, of, of the club. But I don't think that the financial issue had anything to do because Carlos was not going to make any financial gain by signing for Man United or for Manchester City or for Real Madrid. As you know, transfer no. fees stay with the clubs. The clubs and the ownerships of those keep the transfer fees. If today a player is sold out of Man United, he doesn't benefit financially other than maybe renegotiating his playing contract and it gives him a chance to renegotiate his playing contract. He doesn't gain anything from the transfer. And at that moment in time, the owners of Carlos and the owners of Mascherano actually had no no say in where Carlos went because at the end, Carlos decided where he went by himself. You know very well that Carlos was a very strong player, quite as strong as you. I think he would have had no problems in debating this with you all day long. And, you know, he's he Carlos is a different kind of person. You have to remember, Carlos, when Carlos was born, his father had been shot and killed pre him being born. Um, in Buenos Aires by drug dealers. He was born to a mother who was a, um addict. He was taken out of a, a, a hospital with first-degree burns by his aunt and her husband. Carlos is a guy that has lived right down there at the bottom in 
the favelas. He's never forgotten that during this COVID-19 scenario, he is on the front line of creating uh, his, his foundation and donating lots and lots of um, his own personal wealth into that area and promoting that. Um, he lives very close to the favela where he was, where he was brought up. Um, his friends are still from there. He's not a guy that forgets that. And he's not a guy that, you know, someone can come up to and say, hey, you know, you have to now go to Manchester City. You have to now go to Real Madrid. He was never like that throughout his career. And now even when he, wants, when he was at Juventus, he played two years. He wanted to go back to his boyhood club. Just the same like most of you can, guys can, do. And, can, and, and, and yeah. he again won another trophy. He's not a guy that could have been influenced in any way. And I think you Kia, know that. I, 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 um, no, no, Kia, Kia I, I, I'm fully aware of Carlos's backstory, obviously, when he came to Manchester. And I'm aware of, I said, I said before, he's a warrior of a football player. Uh, I do believe that someone like Carlos, from his background, would also require financial and career support and influence around his business side of things, because that's naturally the same for all football players. We're not businessmen. You know, when we're playing football, we only think of playing football. And my view, when you asked me about who was influencing him, he was influenced, in my opinion, he must have been, by people who owned him because they were very good friends of his. And my point is that the owners of Carlos Tevez, who had a very good relationship with him, someone who Carlos who just played football and was somebody who had uh, an incredible will to play football, those owners made double the money out of Carlos Tevez going to Manchester over staying at Manchester no, The owners United, of Carlos Tevez the were good friends. The owners of Carlos Tevez were not good friends of his, and the owners of Carlos Tevez had no relation with Carlos Tevez. If, if, you, if you understand, if you want to talk about third-party ownership because you're trying to now move the, move the scenario into a, different, into a different spectrum, I don't have a problem with that. The way the third-party ownership works right across South America and how it worked is, you know, clubs could potentially sell the potential revenue or gain of a player to, th to third parties in order to to raise capital to pay because they don't have the same number of TV rights, they don't have the same number of sponsorship numbers, etc., and they need to create capital. The players don't necessarily know where they have been um, or, or, or who could potentially gain a percentage of their rights when they're sold. They don't actually even you know get involved in that. It's more club to financial uh, scenarios. A lot happened here in the in the days when clubs, you know, needed to raise cash. So you uh, okay. didn't Listen, know. Kia, we're going to have to we're going to have to wrap that there. I think the debate over third party ownership is is one that's going to have to be saved for for another time. But thank Kelly, you very much for Kelly, joining us. To talk Kelly, about Kelly, 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 Kia, Kia, me and you have done one incredible thing, by the way, Kia. We've kept Carragher shut for 20 minutes. That's incredible, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a word, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't said a word. <laughs>